those from the judiciary, commissioners, members of the various professions, legal and health and community services, and uh, distinguished guests, one and all. I must say I'm up in Queensland a great deal with the Royal Commission doing private sessions, as I am all of this week. And Bob Atkinson, one of the Royal Commissioners, uh, formerly the, the, the um, Queensland uh, Police Commissioner, uh, gave me a cap the other day with Queensland written all over it. And I promised that I would wear it before the end of the Royal Commission. Whether or not that changes my allegiance in uh, state of origin matches, I'm not yet sure. But it is great to be here. I'd like to also acknowledge the Turbal people and the Indigenous elders, both past and present. But I do so in the very great context of understanding that for the Royal Commission, the way in which Indigenous children, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island children, were dealt with has a particular importance within our work. We recognise absolutely that the harm and impacts done through child sexual abuse were exacerbated by the past policies and practices of so many governments throughout Australia's history. And to understand that the present effects of those are being felt in our criminal justice system, our correctional services and our child protection system. And it's a stark lesson for all of us that influence policy, that the policies we make today can have disastrous and long-term effects. Or conversely, they can have extraordinarily positive outcomes for people and for our nation as a whole. We also want to obviously acknowledge uh, Lenine Ford and the extraordinary inquiry that she chaired. And it does provide an underpinning to the work of the Royal Commission. And it's the fact that it's a few years old now no less weakens its uh, impact for us today. And I, of course, want to acknowledge the child protection workers here today, whether they're lawyers or community service workers or in any of the other disciplines and to your association. Tonight, the faces of those children now adults who have come to the Royal Commission crowd in on us in this room. Their faces, the ones that I've seen today and yesterday and will see tomorrow and the next day here in Brisbane, they speak three things to us or ask three questions. They say, why? Why did this happen to me? I was simply a child. We were simply children. And in a sense, they demand of us, the Royal Commission, and each and every one of you here tonight, a genuine answer to that question. And part of the work of the Royal Commission is to answer that question, not so much on an individual base, but on a systemic base. How could we possibly go forward as a nation in terms of child protection or any other policy if we don't understand the whys of the past? In the very final public hearing of the Royal Commission, which will take place in March of next year, um, will be exactly on that why. And as a nation, we need to answer that question. The second thing they say to us is, do you believe me? Do you believe us? One of the things about the Royal Commission that people always ask is, do you believe the people? And let me say to you, without any equivocation, the six commissioners, including the two judges, have a universal and clear answer to that. The answer is, yes, we do. We believe them. People don't come to the Royal Commission to lie, to make up stories. They come to tell of their trauma as children. It is true that the individual details may not be right. It is true that some people, through mental health illnesses, have some delusions. That is all true. But if you were to ask me, of the many people that we have seen, and I'll talk about that, do I believe them? The answer is yes. 99.9% .9 of those that I have seen, I can say with certainty, I believe they have been abused as children within the institutions that they claim to have been abused within. The details matter little. Whether or not they got the right year matters little to the Royal Commission. But it matters that we believe them as a nation. And today, even in this room and in this building, there will be judges, there will be lawyers, there will be people leading religions. There will be people right throughout this community who don't, who will continue to say, as one lawyer said to a jury the other day, just two weeks ago, that somehow or another we've become obsessed by this issue of institutional abuse. One would hope it was for just effect, a positive effect for him because the jury acquitted the accused. But we know in society that that is still not a one battle. And part of the work of the Royal Commission is to say to the world, yes, we believe those that were abused. And the third thing they say to you and I is, what are you going to do about it? 
And that is a personal and a, um, a whole of uh, nation response. And the question for each of us in this room is what are we going to do about it? Whether we are judges or lawyers, whether we're commissioners, whether we're child protection workers, whether we're health workers, whether we're in the mental health field, what are we going to do about it? Writing the wrongs that were done, but also in creating a safer environment for children going forward. And those three questions that they ask, why, do you believe me, and what are you going to do about it, is what we're about. The Royal Commission was established um, just over um, three and a half years ago, and it will conclude, I think, on the 15th of December next year, at which time the six commissioners will turn into puffs of smoke. They disappear. I don't know what happens to ex-commissioners, but we're going. But that five-year period will be a period of extraordinary both scale and scope in terms of the work we're doing. But I just want to reflect on the Ford Inquiry just for one moment, if I can. And basically, as I understand it, the Ford Inquiry looked at 159 institutions from the period 1911 to 1999, or thereabouts. And it was a remarkably successful inquiry, with 41 of the 42 recommendations being accepted, which is very unusual for most of us that are involved in inquiries. And of course, it wasn't just the inquiry, it was what was followed. A number of reconciliation initiatives were, uh, were initiated, including apologies, commemorative memorials and events, the establishment and delivery of the Queensland Government's redress scheme, the establishment of the Ford Foundation Trust Fund, and community-based support services, all of which have been lasting legacies of that inquiry. But of particular interest to the Royal Commission, I suppose, is those comments that were made in relation to what we might now call systems abuse. And the Ford inquiry identified a number of themes and interesting issues. One was that there was a lack of funding and resourcing which was found to have been continuing right through to the time of the inquiry. And as a result, children did not receive basic services such as education, leisure and recreation, physical and mental health care, and a range of other services necessary to prepare them to function independently. It also said that related to the levels of funding was the relationship between the responsible government department and the denominational institutions licensed by the state. And it found that whilst the funding allocated to these denominational institutions was insufficient to provide proper individual care, the department continued to place children into the care because it was an inexpensive way in which to accommodate children in those eras. But more than that, not only were the churches willing to take them, but to take them as charity cases. It was interesting that the department and the government of the days was not prepared to jeopardise access to such placements even though wrongdoings were known about and there was insufficient monitoring and scrutiny of those agencies. But indeed, even more than that, governments of the day, and particularly politicians, believed that children were being raised, in inverted commas, in a Christian environment. And it was as if that was sufficient, that notwithstanding many other weaknesses in the care and well-being of children, if they were in a Christian environment, that was enough. The Ford Inquiry exposed that, and many of the recommendations went to change and it is pleasing that in Queensland, as it is true in other states, there have been dramatic and many changes. Indeed, Queensland, I was just saying to Michael, goes through many inquiries looking at its systems. I'm sure that you're over inquiries. But the lessons of the forward inquiry are very important because they do go to the foundational relationship between governments, institutions and those that are meant to be served by those institutions. And the Royal Commission's work is all about that. Today, we have three main areas of activity for the Commission, and I want to touch on them very briefly before we look at some of the um, key issues that are emerging. One is about the private sessions in which commissioners bear witness to the experience of survivors. The second is the public hearings or case studies. And the third is in relation to research and policy. If I just take the private sessions for a moment, many of you would be aware that the Royal Commission's main work, in a sense, is this. It is bearing witness to those children who have suffered sexual abuse and today are survivors of that. So far, the Commission has conducted uh, 5,669 individual private sessions, which are, in fact, an, an engagement between an individual commissioner and the individual. 
together with hundreds and hundreds of written accounts, which are read by commissioners as well. And in those interactions, they are the most intense interactions that I've ever experienced in my working life, and I believe that's true for the other five commissioners. It's very important to understand a couple of things about these private sessions. Their intensity comes not only because these are difficult issues, but they look at you constantly throughout the whole of the session, and the one thing they're looking for is that sign of disbelief. So many people in their lives have disbelieved them, from their parents, from teachers, from caseworkers, police, and ultimately the criminal justice system, where the pendulum has not swung in favour of victims or survivors, not yet at least. And so they look to see what you believe or don't believe in their story. It's much more complicated than that, but it's part of what we're about. To date, there are about 1,500 people on the waiting list and the registrations for private sessions can close at the end of this month. And we'll see whether or not there's been a large spike or not. But we will continue private sessions through till October or November of next year. Um, and we have made a guarantee that all people registered by the end of September will be seen. In relation to those private sessions, what are we seeing? We're seeing a number of things. Firstly, we're seeing that over two-thirds of those that have come forward are men, and that is unique. Throughout the world, both in inquiries and in research, it is generally females that are present. And what it indicates very clearly that in the institutions that we in Australia ran, the majority of those that were subject to abuse were boys. And that is, of course, counter to what we see in the community where the vast preponderance of victims are, in fact, girls. The second thing we see absolutely borne out is how long it takes people to actually disclose abuse. And at the moment, it's about an average of 24 years from the first abuse, if not longer. Indeed, in many sessions, we've had people in their 70s and 80s, and I have seen a number of those, and it's their very first time of disclosure. Indeed, recently, we had an 88-year-old uh, person being seen by another commissioner who, for the very first time in his life, disclosed at that meeting. I did have a, an 85-year-old fellow who disclosed to me the sexual abuse, which was substantial and took place in a boy's home and foster care. I said to him, have you told your wife who was in the next room? And he said, no. I said, don't you think she might guess, given this is the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse? And he said, yes. I said, it might be a good idea to tell her. And he was about to do that. But he couldn't bring himself to talk about it for a whole range of reasons. But at 85, he could, he did, and he will tell his wife. The sessions themselves, um, have elicited a number of areas of interest, and I'll come to those in a moment. But there's a particular project that we're undertaking right around Australia, and that is to take private sessions in prisons, where men and women are serving time but were abused as children. In Queensland, we've done private sessions in Woodford, Townsville Men's, Brisbane's Women's, Lotus Glen, Walston, Brisbane Men's, and Maryborough. And we've just finished that last week, and I was in Maryborough to do that. These stories show a particular haunting pattern. And whilst all stories are different to some degree, for the men and women in the correctional services, the pattern is not so different. And that pattern is very clear. Very early and high levels of domestic violence within the family unit, often with some form of abuse of the child themselves, early intervention by the state, and movement into out-of-home care, where subsequent abuse took place, either by the carer, a relative of the carer, or another child within the foster care placement or home. Very early intervention into, juve into juvenile justice services, where it is likely, more likely than not that some abuse will have taken place, and then often and repeated incarceration in the adult juvenile system. And for men, that changes when they get to about 35 or 40. Some people say that's about when men mature. But it is something very interesting that men in jail at about 35 or 40 have a very significant change in the way in which they see their lives. They don't say, we want to be good citizens. They don't suddenly become morally um, new citizens. They simply say, I can't do this anymore. And the window of opportunity opens for them 
and for us as a society. But in terms of abuse, that pattern is clear. What's striking with that is government and non-government organisations have intervened in their lives dozens of times. Why is it, therefore, that on the dozens of times that state and non-government organisations have intervened in their lives, the outcome has been no different? And in part, it goes to our failure to completely understand the nature of trauma in children and to identify not only what are the presenting problems but also the underlying causes. Indeed, in correctional services throughout Australia, there was a policy in most jails that staff, including counsellors, were not to ask the why. They were simply meant to deal with the presenting issues for the fear that if you, in fact, took a trauma-informed approach and tried to understand why, then, in fact, that would open up um, serious problems which could not be dealt with in the correctional service system. Part of our mission in seeing these jails is to re-educate correctional authorities to understand that trauma-aware or trauma-informed approaches are both um, necessary but also um, capable of being delivered within the correctional services facilities. In Queensland itself, what are the institutions that come up? So far across Australia, 3,000 institutions have been separately identified of places of abuse and involving over 20,000 allegations of abuse by those that have attended the private sessions. The top hitters in Queensland won't surprise the mean, but they are, of course, Wilson Youth Hospital Centre, um, Westbrook Youth Centre, Boys Town Bow Desert, St Joseph's Home near Col, St Vincent's Home Nudgee, the Salvation Army Boys Homes at Riverview and Indora Pilly, Sherberg Aboriginal Settlement, Brisbane Grammar School, the second most complained about school in Australia, and the Government Child Protection and Out-of-Home Care Services. It's interesting that range from juvenile justice to boys' homes to Aboriginal settlements and to elite private schools. That is just the top in Queensland, and there are many, many others that have been identified. Nine out of the ten in, of the survivors have reported their perpetrators were male, but many were also abused by females. And one of the stories that are perhaps underdone in the Royal Commission is the issue of female perpetrators. This is particularly true in two contexts, one of which is in foster care, where there have been a number of reports of foster care, well, female foster carers abusing children, and sometimes on a sustained basis over many years. Um, the other one, of course, has been in some of the schools, and the outcomes for those are perverse. In one case, a child, a young woman, was abused by a nun, a religious sister. She was abused quite severely over a period of time. Strangely enough, the survivor of that abuse then entered the same religious order as the sister. Some years later, she met the a perpetrator at a gathering of the congregation and subsequently had what she described as a breakdown. She left the order. She was not, in fact, critical of the order. The order, in fact, made an apology. The nun who had perpetrated admitted the perpetration and there was a settlement paid. And the survivor of that abuse is complementary of that particular order. But it was just an example of how strange the area we are in um, that these things occur. One of the other areas, of course, is the long-term nature of the abuse that we see, of the impacts of those abuses that we see as well. As well. And I'll come to that in one moment in relation to the criminal justice context. But at the present time, the average length of time of abuse is 2.5 years. And 80% of those that present to the Royal Commission have been abused on multiple occasions and or multiple perpetrators. The notion that this is often a one-off event that takes place um, is not so for the majority of those that are coming to the Royal Commission. It is absolutely true we have seen many people in the private sessions. One of the most extraordinary things for us, however, has been the understanding that the event itself is not a predeterminer or a predictor of the level of impact. Much of the research has indicated that, for example, penetration and long-term sexual abuse by a perpetrator will have more profound effects than shorter term or what others would have called less intrusive um, abuse. And that may well be so, except to say that in the private sessions we've seen many people that have been dramatically impacted 
by a one-off or, or what would have been otherwise regarded as a minor offence. I'll give you an example of that. I was uh, doing a private session with a 40-year-old male who was married with children and a very successful job until very recently. He was on a youth camp when he was six or seven years of age. On two nights during the youth camp, he was fondled, and that was the extent of the abuse. Um, he maintains that it didn't impact on him during school or secondary school. Nevertheless, at the age of 40, the man has lost his job, his marriage is in difficulty, um, he's now in uh, deep troubles in terms of depression, and the whole of the incident has come back as a recurring nightmare on a regular basis. Most of us not, would not have thought that was the outcome of that particular event. And that is not an uncommon um, issue. So on the one hand, we have very sustained periods of abuse. And on the other hand, we have short-term nature of abuse that is having large impacts. And researchers can continue to look at that for a long while to come. But what it does raise is that we should never predetermine what the nature of the impact would be just on the circumstances of the abuse. Of course, the criminal justice system does the reverse. It always looks and judges impact based on the nature of the actual offence itself. And yet, delivery reality is something quite different to that. A couple of other things that emerge in those uh, private sessions. Domestic violence is a significant issue, not just for those in the criminal justice system um, and those that are in correctional services, but across the board. Early vulnerabilities and risks are clearly identified for those where domestic violence and familial abuse was present. The second is bullying and physical violence in the institutions is another one which is very, very clear to us. It's very clear that in institutions where there were large clusters of abusers, particularly religious institutions, then indeed bullying was part of that. There was a bullying of culture by staff against other staff. There was a bullying culture by staff against children. And in fact, they were bullies generally in life. Many of those, in fact, used their bullying, their standover tactics, their physical violence as a means of perpetrating. Not in all cases, for in fact, many perpetrators are in fact quite weak and other factors are at play as to why they may perpetrate. We noted, for example, in a number of cases that workers simply would not believe children, both in government and non-government agencies. A recurring theme in historic abuse was that case workers used to visit and interview children in foster care and out-of-home care in the presence of carers who were often the very abusers. They rarely, if ever, spoke to the child independent of the adult and rarely, if ever, accepted the version of a story given by children. One would hope that that has changed dramatically in our current child protection practices. Why is foster care so important is because 40% of all of the private session allegations are in relation to out-of-home care providers, including boys and girls' homes of the past. And today, 40,000 children in Australia are in fact in out-of-home care tonight. So it's a contemporary issue. Other issues that have emerged is that early sexualised behaviours or inappropriate ideations were never dealt with. And in fact, they were only treated with blame or punishment. One of the emerging issues in schools and in foster care and out-of-home care more generally is early sexualised behaviours of children. The question is how do we respond now to those behaviours? It is true that parents of children that have been affected by this often claim it's child abuse. And there's no doubt at all for the child that's been subject to the sexualised behaviour it is. But for the child that's offending, if I can use that term carefully, what are the support systems in place that would in fact be able to support that child dealing with their aberrant sexual behaviours? Indeed, in the prisons that I've been visiting, about 20 to 30 per cent are child sex offenders themselves. And one gets the rare opportunity to talk to those men, and to a lesser degree women, not in terms of their crime, but a little bit about their histories. And a number of them, but not all, but a number of them have said, what would have happened had I said to somebody, I have this predisposition towards having sex with children? Who could I have safely said that to? Who would have supported me through that? And today, that's a very significant issue for all of us. As we see increasing levels of sexualised behaviour 
amongst children, what is our response and how will we deal with it? Previously it was undealt with and the consequences for the abused and for the offender have been severe. We also noted that children, particularly historically, did not receive education in sexual matters, did not understand grooming and couldn't pick up on the signs that were occurring. Again, the question is today, have we changed sufficiently well that children now have what we would call protective factors in place? And another one, of course, is the trauma-informed practice was not common and long-lasting nature of impacts was rarely understood. The expression of get over it, you know, um, was still very common up until a few years ago. The one thing we know about child sexual abuse is people don't get over it. Um, they may learn to deal in various ways with the impacts of that trauma, but the one thing we know is they don't get over it. And yet that was the response of, to so many, and even today would still be the case in some environments. We've also, um, in, those, uh, in those private sessions, um, I think learnt a great deal more about some of the offending behaviours. And one of the things the Commission will be doing is to try to understand offenders. Um, those that have abused survivors. And we are talking to those that have offended. There are research projects in relation to that. And in many senses, the private sessions, whilst they are generally not about offenders, some of them have been with, not only in jails but external, those that have in fact gone on to not only be abused but have gone on to be offenders themselves later on. And it's an important part of our considerations. In terms of the public hearings, which you're well aware of, today we've released uh, three reports, one into an ashram, one into Knox Grammar, and uh, one into the three juvenile justice centres in Victoria. And uh, they are just illustrations, um, if you look at those reports that have been released, of the sorts of public hearings and the inquiries we're making. In Queensland, we've looked at the Salvation Army homes, St Joseph's near Cole, Brisbane Grammar, St Paul's Anglican College and a disability service called FSG Australia and a Catholic primary school in Toowoomba. Um, and that's just in relation to Queensland. But we've, in addition to that, obviously had Queensland representation in a number of our systemic or policy-related hearings. And they've included a, a, a two weeks of a public hearing in relation to schools and a, another two weeks in relation to out-of-home care. Um, and so those sorts of public hearings are extremely important. We are publishing those case studies as we go, and, and um, I think it's 22, in fact today, 25 case studies have now been produced and are worth a read, and I'll come back to it. And the last area that we're involved in is research and policy. And to date, 100 projects have been commissioned throughout Australia in relation to matters both including the criminal justice system, civil litigation, redress, and a whole range of child protection issues directly. It's the largest body of work ever uh, commissioned by one organisation and will be a lasting legacy for the future. So in just very short, I want to just deal with three particular pieces of work very briefly, just to give you an understanding of the sorts of breadth that we're looking at as we go forward. The criminal justice system itself has been the subject of much discussion and we ourselves have put out a consultation paper last week and it's a tome. Let me tell you, it's very large. And the reason for that is that the criminal justice system has been the focus of so much commentary by those that have survived child sexual abuse but have found a lack of justice in the system. I should say a couple of things. The first thing is the vast majority of people in private sessions have not reported their matters to the police. And that's curious, but there are others. Those that have, their experiences have been very mixed and different, some very good and some woefully bad. But we've taken the criminal justice project as a major piece of work. It'll probably be one of the most significant pieces of work. And the consultation paper deals with everything from the moment a report is made to the police right through to sentencing. And it looks at the whole range, including um, the way in which juries, judges and the whole sentencing process occurs. And it is a seminal piece of work. One of the things we've also done, and I'll come back to the paper in one second, is in fact research. Let me give you an example of that. 
We recently published what we regard as a groundbreaking primary research study focused on the criminal justice system. And the research explored jury reasoning in what's joint and separate trials of institutional child sexual abuse. This is the largest study to ever undertaken in the world that looks at jury behaviour in regard to child sexual abuse. It involved 90 mock juries involving 1,000 people who were eligible to be jurors and participated in the project. We have to remember when we look at child sexual abuse that child sexual abuse offences are generally committed in private with no witnesses and in some cases, in fact most cases, no medical or scientific evidence capable of confirming the abuse. And of course it takes place generally a long time after the actual abuse itself. One of the big problems in the Australia at the moment is this issue about joint trials or separate trials. Let me give an illustration of that. In a private session, a gentleman was abused at a school. There were six other children abused at that school by the same person. Each of the trials were separated. That is, there were six independent trials. The first five trials all led to an acquittal of the accused. In, the, in the relation to the fellow that was in my private session, he was successful and the person was found guilty and given a two-year sentence. I just want you to think for one moment about that scenario. Five or six victims of sexual abuse, not grooming, although that is in fact a sexual abuse, of penetrative and contact sex in the same school by the same alleged perpetrator and we separated the trials leading to five acquittals. That is not unusual in Australia. The reason for that occurring is our belief in the way in which juries operate and our misconceptions in many senses about how that actually occurs. In the, jury tri in the research we did, we found this, that the juries are able to distinguish different charges against an accused and base their verdicts on the evidence relative to each count even where there is a joint trial involving multiple um, victims or where additional information and evidence has been given in relation to the bad character of that particular individual. I'll come back to that in a moment. But our criminal justice system has made many assumptions over its life. And whilst I'm not here to attack the criminal justice system it's per se, it is time that we actually were prepared to make some significant changes. Criminal justice involves the interests of the entire community in the detection and punishment of crime in general and in addition to the personal interests of both the victim and or survivor of the particular crime. We recognise that criminal justice is important to survivors, not only seeking justice for them personally but also encouraging the reporting of child sexual abuse and preventing abuse into the future. Some of the myths, however, that have arisen in relation to the criminal justice system, particularly in relation to child sexual abuses, have had a profound effect. And some of those are very clear. Women and children make up stories of sexual abuse. This was a commonly held view in Australia and in our criminal systems for a very long period of time, that somehow or another women and children were not to be believed, particularly in historic terms. A second was that a victim of child sexual abuse will cry for help and attempt to escape their abuser. That is, there will be no delay in reporting abuse, for a real victim will raise, as they say, hue and cry as soon as they are abused. The evidence is overwhelmingly that it, for men it takes at least two to three decades and for women a short period, a slightly shorter period. In fact, juries were directed to discount the credibility of the victim witness if in fact they had not disclosed and brought the matter forward earlier. And yet the evidence has been in clear stark uh, abundance for some time that that is not the way in which victims operate. Yet the system failed to change, or certainly failed to change. Another was that a victim of sexual abuse will avoid the abuser. That is, a real victim will not return to the abuser or spend time with them or have mixed feelings about them. And yet, case after case is quite contrary to that. Let me give you two illustrations, very similar. A fellow, a young boy, was abused by a priest at the age of 14. The inappropriate sexual relationship continued 
through until the boy left the school. But what happened thereafter was interesting. The boy eventually married, and the celebrant at the marriage service was the priest that had abused him. The priest then went on to have further abused the boy in his early 20s, whilst the man was actually then married. To most of us, it's inconceivable. To the courts, it seems completely incomprehensible. And yet, we understand only now the dynamics about social, sexual abuse, the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim, and how this can go on for years. Was that isolated? No, it wasn't. I was in Queensland recently, and a woman came in. She formed a relationship again with a minister of religion at about the age of 14 or 15. The relationship went on right through until she was in her mid-20s. He, in fact, officiated at her wedding and then had an affair with her after the wedding. She, of course, is 40 or 45 now, and her marriage is in disarray, and all of the trauma associated with that abuse is now before us. But these are things that we have to start to understand. The nature of sexual abuse does not fit that caricature of the victim rushing away from the abuser, certainly not in the institutional context, and indeed even in familial arrangements. And the last one is that sexual assault including a child sexual assault, can be detected by medical examination. And, of course, we understand that that is simply not the case, either at the time or much later on. So very simply, let me say that we've come to a very clear view that in relation to the evidence that can be brought to court, there needs to be a change. And that change is about increasing the admissibility of what's called tendency evidence. And we must move to a situation where joint trials become more the norm than, in fact, the exception to it. Having considered all of the evidence and submissions, research and other material available, it seems that a rational argument can be made that the court concerns about unfair prejudice are misplaced. And as a consequent, relevant evidence in the form of tendency and coincidence evidence has unnecessarily been kept from juries. As a consequence, there are likely to have been unjust outcomes in the form of unwarranted acquittals in institutional child sexual abuse prosecutions. We are now reasonably satisfied that the current law needs to change to facilitate more cross-admissibility of evidence and more joint trials in child sexual abuse matters. And we think that there is strong evidence for that. Without going into much more detail, let me simply say uh, there have already been very substantial changes in England and Wales and they have moved more substantially than any jurisdiction in Australia from the current position to where the basis of the introduction of evidence is relevance. Is it relevant to the facts before the court? Lawyers talk a lot about reasonable men. We occasionally talk about reasonable women. Or if we're really good, we talk about reasonable people. I don't think there are too many reasonable people in Australia which would concurrently understand or accept that when acquittals are given, and only after the acquittals do we find out about past conduct of the individual, past bad character of the individual, and even convictions. Indeed, for the victim it must be galling, not so far as that there's been an acquittal, but to realise the acquittal was obtained without all of the relevant information being provided to the juries. How distressing it must therefore be for juries who have made a decision to acquit only to discover evidence that was relevant but not admitted. Indeed, England and Wales have moved well beyond that 11 years ago. And surely it's time in Australia that we can move forward. Another area I just want to touch on just to show the extent of our work is, of course, about child safe organisations. And here we are very committed to a future and forward looking agenda. We've done considerable research, including through the Queensland University of Technology, into the principles that should underpin what we might call a child-safe organisation. And bearing in mind we're talking about organisations as wide as sporting clubs and churches, government agencies and non-government providers, ch childcare and schools. And so how do we come up with a framework for that? What we've done is published a couple of weeks ago a list of 10 key principles that underpin a child safe organisation. We're looking at how that should be implemented and it won't come as a surprise to you that we believe that part of the framework should be um, by way of regulation. 
Queensland, South Australia and recently, in the last year, Victoria, have now legislated that organisations that provide services to children are required to meet certain minimum principles um, in relation to child safe organisations. We believe that, in fact, that can go further and our particular principles, we believe, ultimately may need to be embedded in some form of regulatory response. Now, why is that? Because when we started this, many of us would have thought it could be voluntary. What the Royal Commission and the Lenain Ford Inquiry has shown is that in child sexual abuse, too many people have too many opinions which they hold to be true. And what they do is they say, well, I'm not sure that that's actually child sexual abuse. I'm not actually sure that that actually happened. I'm not sure we should report it. Mandatory reporting, which exists within the community generally, does one thing. It takes away your individual view or perception. It simply says, if it is, you report it. And similarly with child safe principles, each of you will have a different version about those principles. But if ultimately the research shows that these principles are essential to underpin a child safe organisation, although flexibly applied depending on the nature of the organisation, perhaps it is important that we actually say, and these are required, for the same reason that it takes away not the way that you want to implement it, that has to be flexible, but whether or not you think it should be implemented at all. And the difficulty we face in institutional abuse is you can get a good leader who suddenly embraces change only to be replaced by another who questions those. And the well-being of children is too valuable to be depending on my opinion or Tammy's opinion or anybody else's opinion. It's time that we created an environment which is not dependent on my view, but rather says this is what is necessary. Having regard, however, to the important fact that it has to be flexibly applied given the range and nature of the organisations. And of course, these principles must apply to government agencies. They cannot simply be for non-government organisations or private providers of children's services. But the one underpinning principle is that it must be based on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Child principle, which is about the primary consideration being for the child. And I really want to ask this question, in whose interest do we act? In whose interest do institutions act in relation to the matters we've been dealing with? What must become abundantly clear to you is that many institutions may have been acting in various interests, but they weren't acting in the interests of the child. Some of the practices that we've discovered and uncovered could not in any way be regarded as practices that would have been informed by a child-centred focus. It is very clear that many institutions did not, in fact, act in the best interests of children. Now, it's not an easy principle. It's a very difficult principle to apply because in your organisation, whatever that may be, there are multiple competing uh, factors at any one time. Nevertheless, it is time that we put ch children and their safety at the heart. And that has to be done in a way that can actually be tested, not just stated. It's not a rhetorical statement. It's something that has to be embedded in good practice. And child protection workers today struggle because all of you will say to me that you act in the best interest of the child. But then you will tell me about the competing pressures that you're under and the extraordinary different accountabilities and in the end, it's not surprising that many of you will not act in the best interest of the child. You will act in some other interest, unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. In the historic matters we've seen was very intentional. Today, one of the reports in relation to um, one of the schools that I've just mentioned, uh, we have come to the conclusion that the principal um, acted in the interests of the reputation of the school and knowingly in fact, acted against the interests of children in that school. In fact, failed to disclose and actively obstructed investigation into child sexual abuse matters in relation to six children. And that was released uh, yesterday. That is not an isolated example of institutions failing to act in the best interests. But it begs one question, and that's about the first principle, and that is about child safety is embedded in the institutional leadership, governance and culture of the organisation. Let me be abundantly clear that when we talk about historical abuse, the one statement that you will hear amongst all professions and groups is that it was, a, it was about the time. This was something about the time. 
Of course, our approach to children, in fact, was contextual as to the time. We didn't have the Convention on the Rights of Children until the mid-70s. Children were originally seen as chattels, possessions of adults, and their rights were, were therefore accordingly nothing more than chattels. We changed that. We changed them to having rights as people in the making. They weren't real people. They would be people eventually, and our rights were that. These were about protecting things that would eventually be people in the making, until, of course, we went to the rights. And so, therefore, the way in which institutions treated children is contextual. It's all kind of so contextual as to the ideology of the organisations. Tammy could talk more about that in relation to Indigenous policy. But let me just talk about some of the faith-based organisations. 62% of all of the private sessions relate to faith-based organisations. 10% to other non-government agencies, 27% to government institutions. So faith-based rate higher. In one of the faith-based organisations, the culture that existed right through until the 50s, 60s and thereafter was that the children that were in their homes were in fact a progeny of evil, immoral relationships. And the primary goal of the organisation was the salvation of the soul of these children who were otherwise destined to, in fact, burn in the fires of hell. You think I exaggerate. It wasn't. It was in their original documents. And whilst it is true that they would say they were trying to look after the well-being of the child, the whole thing was about salvation. If you believe that a child is of that nature, would it surprise you that somebody that has a particular predilection to either violence, emotional abuse or sexual abuse may not feel free to be able to treat children in a way that would not be acceptable in the rest of the community. And so when we look at these institutions, it's important to look not only at the context politically and legally, but also what actually motivated them at that time. Children were often told they were hopeless, they were unloved, nobody wanted them, they would in fact go into crime, they would be failures in the world. Children time and time and time were told that. That doesn't come just out of thin air. Nevertheless, in the very same era, we see organisations that had an entirely different approach. In a private session, a young man um, was severely abused within a uh, faith-based um, boys' home, and it was a regular occurrence, both physical and sexual abuse. He was removed from that institution and placed into another faith-based organisation, but of a similar character. Uh, different organisation. On the night that he got there, he was so angry that he attacked um, not only property but individuals. And the people in that place hugged him. And it was the very first time he'd ever been hugged as a child, ever. Not by his parents, not by his carers, never. And he went on in that institution to say the people there cared for him, they were compassionate, and they loved him. Same era, same type of organisation, same type of institution. What really mattered was people. At the end of the day, people made a choice to treat children in the way they did, or they chose another course. And so I'm not very forgiving of the notion that it's all about time. It wasn't. It was about people and the times. But ultimately, people made choices. The other thing that happened was, of course, in education, particularly in private schools and particularly Catholic schools and particularly schools that I went to, Christian Brothers and others, who rate highly, as you would imagine, in our private session material. Was it ever acceptable, ever, that we saw statistic treatment of children not only being punished with the canes or the multiple straps that they used to invent, but in fact actually inflict physical violence, including broken noses, broken collarbones, broken rib cages. Was that ever acceptable? And yet people knew about that. It is true, they say, I did not know that Fred or Brother Fred or Father Fred or whoever it might have been was abusing children. I accept that. Except they knew that they were physically abusing children and they were emotionally abusing children through being bullies and intimidating. If you allow for physical abuse to take place, if you allow for emotional abuse to take place, should it surprise you, therefore, that those that have a particular predilection or a weakness even, if you want to use that expression, may not in fact feel comfortable to be able to perpetrate sexual abuse in that environment? And of course it's true. 
that some of the perpetrators we've seen used violence as a means of achieving um, sexual abuse. It's equally true that some did not. It's equally true that many, in fact, fell into relationships with children which was actually based on their own inadequacies and their own uh, weaknesses. But for many, it was, in fact, the act of violence. Indeed, for some, the act of violence was part of the sexual act itself, and they got sexual pleasure in relation to the physical violence that occurred. But my point about all of that is actually going back to the culture and the leadership that exists in the organisations. I go back to the point that in order to secure that into the future, some sort of regulatory um, interventions are necessary. But ultimately, they won't actually change the culture of organisations. Other things listed in those child safe matters might. I'm conscious of the time, and I just want to finish with just one last one, and that's in relation to civil litigation and redress. And I just want to make the point that we've issued a report in relation to redress and civil litigation. And it is our hope that the Commonwealth and state governments will agree on a national redress scheme. But can I make the point that irrespective of that, at some stage, the individual state jurisdictions may need to act independent of the Commonwealth, although that's not a desirable outcome. We are very conscious of the work done in Queensland. We're very conscious of the, of the arrangements that were set up. But let me make two points. Very many of the people that were in Queensland that accessed that scheme got the $7,000, which was for basically being in the institution. Very few of any of the ones we've seen actually disclose sexual abuse. They simply disclose some of the physical abuse that took place. Many others missed out on the deadline. And more importantly than all of that, in hindsight, and looking at the contemporary figures that we've been looking at, it's probably an inadequate response today. But nevertheless, Queensland was one of the jurisdictions that did act. New South Wales and Victoria still have no redress schemes in place. And so it is urgent and important that we move forward. But the other part of the coin is in relation to civil litigation. And we've made a number of recommendations about that. And it is pleasing that the Queensland Government has just announced that the statute of limitations in relation to civil litigation will in fact be removed for certain types of offences. And that is appropriate. Um, and that is important. Whether it's gone far enough or not, that's for others to determine. I should say, however, there is one major issue that we've also put forward, and that is a change to the liability that should be imposed on institutions and organisations. The Commission believes that it is now appropriate that some forms of institutions should now have a strict liability attached. We believe that, based on work that's been done in England and elsewhere, that the time has come to acknowledge that some of the organisations have such a close relationship and a supervisory oversight of children that, in fact, strict liability should apply in, in relation to criminal activities undertaken by their employees or volunteers. And there's a very detailed analysis of that position. It's a controversial position. It's one that we wait governments and others comment on. But it is curious to us that, in fact, when you're looking at this particular area, if you ask yourself this question, if my child today went to a childcare centre and was criminally abused by a volunteer or employee in that centre, would you believe that that centre should be held liable? It's a simple question. And we asked that of a major childcare provider. And they said, as a parent and as an individual, yes. As an organisation, no. But, in a sense, it's a very big question. If you send a child to school and the child is sexually abused by an employee or volunteer in that school, should the institution be liable for that abuse, notwithstanding the fact that it is of a criminal nature? Well, you can ponder that, because we actually think it's time for some change. At the very least, we believe that for all institutions that deal with children, the onus of proof needs to be reversed, such that an institution would be liable unless it can prove that it has taken reasonable steps to ensure the safety of the children in its care. We believe that that is a minimum and is a change from the current position. Ladies and gentlemen, there are hundreds of issues that I could talk about, but I won't because I think Tammy's got to leave and you've probably got to go as well. We have um, 18 months or less to go. The work of the Commission covers a huge range of issues right across some of the most important work is in relation to um, 
the very practical issue of how do you build protective factors in children? How do you encourage children to disclose abuse? How do you encourage um, organisations to be responsive by better complaint handling processes and so on? And we're looking at many of the other areas that you're aware of, including out-of-home care, in a very detailed way. So let me just conclude with two things, but in the last one about disclosure. We did a piece of research through the Australian Catholic University which talked to children. And most interestingly, in relation to that research, they said that before they would disclose to an organisation, they would look to see how the organisation is dealing with bullying. We can get rid of that. Um, and they would look at bullying. And their proxy indicator for whether it's safe to report is whether or not the school deals with bullies. And if the school is not capable of dealing with bullies, why would they trust them on issues of sexual abuse? I leave you to ponder that the wisdom of children is profound, because it is eminently sensible that they would do that, especially with the um, campaigns. The second one is I want to leave you with just one final pr private session. There was a man that came in the very earliest parts of the, um, the work of the Commission. He'd been very bad. He'd been an orphan at the time of his birth, and for reasons which are not clear to me, he was never fostered or adopted. He spent all of his childhood in orphanages and similar facilities. He did commit no criminal activities or no juvenile justice issues at all. He sat in the um, private sessions, and at the end of it, he made this statement to me, which is profound, and that is, he said, I have never been loved and I have never had anyone to love. In the whole of his life, for not one day in that life had he had anyone who he believed loved him. More tragically, he'd never had anyone he could love. He was becoming more reclusive. He had an absolute fear of going into aged care facilities, uh, which is a common phenomenon for children abused in institutional care. We can't give to that man the love that he's lost nor can I be even certain that he will find someone to love into the future. But what we can give to him is a certain that we will listen to his story, that we will believe him, that we will act on it, and in some shape we will give justice to him and others who have been abused like him. If we can do that for him, we've done something, even if it falls well short of that which he needs most, and that is love. Thank you very much. <laughs>